Right, hello everyone. Welcome to part five of our offshore wind series. And today, which is the final part of the presentation, we're going to look at the wind farm layout, construction and operation. As a reminder of what we've learned so far, in part one, we had an introduction to the general concept of renewable energy. So the different times of types of renewable energy that there are and when they might be used and why. In part two, we looked at the general principles of a wind turbine, their main parts and their architecture. So things like main bearings, we looked at blades, we looked at direct drive versus geared turbines and so on. In part three, we looked at some auxiliary components of the wind farm. And in part four, the most recent part, we looked at the electrical layout of the wind farm, some transformer systems, cables, switch gear, auxiliary equipment, control gear, and so on. This is the final part, part five. So here we're going to look at the layout, construction and operation of a wind farm. Now, before we begin on this, I must give a little bit of a caveat that the layout, construction and operation of a wind farm is substantially more complicated than I can do it justice in an hour or so presentation. So this is going to be a little bit more of an overview. I'm going to show you the general concepts and some pictures without going into anything like the detail that you might need to do if, for example, you wanted to build one of these things or even go for an interview. However, hopefully it will be enough to kick you off and uh, get you doing your own research. Let's get on with it then. A quick reminder of the general situation on a wind farm. We've got your wind turbine over here mounted on some kind of foundation. I've shown a jacketed foundation here, but as I've said before, the majority of wind farms are on monopile foundations. We then have intra-array cables conducting that electricity, usually to an offshore substation, where it then goes down an export cable to the onshore substation and then to the electricity market. For today, we are primarily going to be looking at the design layout and construction of this part here because the process for installing a wind turbine foundation, for example, is very similar to the process for installing an offshore substation. The process for installing a turbine on a foundation is not that dissimilar to installing the top side onto a substation, although maybe we may use a different vessel type. Uh, cables in particular are something that I'm really not an expert on the installation of. So rather than waffle about it, I'm just going to show you the general principle and you can do your own research on that. Let's then take a look. Before we even build a wind farm, we need to have an organization that is capable of building that wind farm. And one of the first things we need to do is identify where we're going to build it and what it is. Now, the process for this is tedious and bureaucratic. It varies from country to country, but most countries follow a system similar to that in the UK, which effectively pioneered a lot of this. And the general approach is that the government body, which in the UK would be the Crown Estate for England or the Scottish Crown Estate for Scotland, they will identify areas of the sea for development based on reasons. Organisations are then invited to bid for a lease to develop that farm. So the Crown Estate might say, or the Crown Estate Scotland might say, look, you've got these areas up here, come along chaps, um, tell us what you're gonna do with them, give us your best offer. Now, in principle, anyone can apply to develop a wind farm, but in practice, the process of submitting, creating and submitting this bid is extremely long and extremely tedious and requires an enormous capital investment because you have to do things like environmental impact assessments, for example, you have to convince yourself that you're going to get enough money out of it. So you effectively have to do at least a general layout of the wind farm, um, a general design. You have to approach the market to get anticipated costs of how much it's going to cost and so on. So in practice, the people that develop these generally have the names that sound like sexually transmitted diseases. So they're usually three letter abbreviations like SSE, Dong, 
which is now Orsted. Apparently, that was just too obvious. W P D R W E. So the bid is officially allocated to the quote unquote most competitive bidder. Now, in the UK, the most competitive bidder is generally going to be the cheapest. So what I mean by cheapest is that's the one that claims that they're going to be able to sell electricity at the lowest price. Now, in other countries like Taiwan, where I am at the moment, other things are taken into consideration, in particular, how much money this wind farm is going to contribute to the local economy in the form of localization requirements. Then the developer spends even more money and finalizes the wind farm design. So this is a detailed design phase of what it is, where it is, exactly what components it's going to use, where they're going to go, how they're going to be built. Then we start the construction of the farm and then we commission the farm, switch it on and vast quantities of cash come flooding into the company for the benefit of the shareholders, which after all are the people that us humble workers really strive for. And as a general goal at the moment, this process can take up to five years, of which the majority of the time is in this development and bid allocation stage. Generally, once a bid has been allocated, it's reasonable to actually get that wind farm operating in four to five years um, or less. So most of the time spent is the bureaucratic phase and governments around the world are striving to improve that because it does take a little bit too long. And unfortunately, because of developments in wind farms, you end up essentially having to completely redesign the farm over your original scope because the manufacturers have come up with bigger turbines and so on. This process is roughly like this in most countries that have serious offshore wind programs. Developing the wind farm layout i.e. where everything's going to go, where your offshore substations are going to go, what kind of cables you're going to have, where you're going to put each individual turbine, what sort of foundation systems you're going to have, is not a trivial process. And to my mind, it's one of the most interesting parts of the pre-construction process, because as you can imagine, there are a lot of inputs. I've just named a few of them here. So water depth, soil and met ocean conditions, turbine choice, foundation style, manufacturing capacity, installation equipment, costs and reliability. These are just some of the things that go into deciding what the layout of your farm is going to be. Here, for example, I have a generic picture off the internet because I'd be breaking confidentiality rules if I showed you the actual farms I'm working on. Uh, and on this generic farm, you have several different types of foundations. I've only really shown you two types of foundations, monopiles and jackets, because they're the most common. There are other types like gravity base and suction bucket, but they're not as common. Now, the water depth is sown in differing colors. So what you might do is you might allocate your turbines based on water depth, because if you have them in a shallower water depth, let's say you have this region that you can develop, you might opt to put the turbines in the shallowest place, which bizarrely is sown in red in this chart, rather than in the deeper spots, which are in blue. So there's nothing to say that you couldn't clump your turbines, for example, into one corner of the farm and then just have a couple of outliers. Alternatively, you may realise that there's much more wind over here in the dark place. So it, even though it's going to be more expensive because you're going to need bigger, heavier foundations, you're still going to make a much higher return if you cluster your turbines out there. You also have things like the cable runs between the turbines. They generally need to be buried at least one meter under the lowest point of the sand. If you have conditions such as in Taiwan where you have sand waves, these are exactly what they sound like. They're gigantic sort of sand waves that slowly travel along the sea floor and they can have a tip to tip height of up to 10 meters, then at the lowest point, you then need to put the cable under that. So you need an 11 meter trench essentially to put the cable in. You do not wish to do that. That is a very expensive thing to do. So you might end up routing the cables around the existing location of the sand waves or putting the turbines in a position which is acceptable to that. 
again this kind of drives a foundation style then you might have a local condition which says foundations or whatever need to be made locally and then you're screwed because you can only have a certain type of foundation installation equipment comes into it you may want to build your farm quickly but the installation vessels are not available so perhaps you have to design your farm with smaller or modular components so you can use vessels that are available and so on this is an iterative process um, it's not done lightly and it can make or break a wind farm there have been several wind farms which may even have committed to a bid process um, and then halfway through they've decided no that's not economic we're going to drop it there's been one or two where they've even gone through the bid and then had to do a long and expensive divestment procedure where they've either sell, sold the project to some other fool or they've managed to get out of it altogether so it's not a given that just because the crown estate or whoever says you can build a wind farm there that it's necessarily a good idea to do so you also got to develop an O&M or operation and maintenance philosophy. So how are you going to fix these things? Where's your operation and maintenance port going to be? Who's going to do it? Is it us or are we going to contract it out to somebody else? And so on and so on. We've got to select an O&M port, which may also be a control port for the system. So this is where we're going to base our operations and maintenance from and that port may or may not have extensive workshop and warehouse facilities it really does depend on the farm no two farms are the same so my main point here is that developing the layout of a wind farm is quite a complex process which can take a couple of years if you really want to do it properly let's look now at the marshalling harbour this is for construction so we've been through the phase of we've designed our wind farm we have somehow convinced the company that we work for to put their hands in their pockets to build it, um, you know, which is not a trivial sum of money. So for a 500 megawatt wind farm, you're looking at anything up to two billion dollars to build the thing. Then you've obviously got to operate it on top of that. So, you know, these are not trivial sums of money. But once we've committed, yards start putting stuff out and one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to have a marshalling or construction harbour. And typically that is going to be used to store piles and transition pieces prior to the loadout. So what I mean is we're going to gather these foundations, as you see here, these jacket foundations in this case at a port, and then we'll either sail them out on barges or directly on a heavy lift vessel to the construction site. So ideally this marshalling harbour is going to be quite close to where we want to build the farm. It may also be the same harbour that will later be used for the wind turbine generated components, but alternatively other site or sites may be used. If you're building a wind farm in the UK, for example, and you're using blades that are made in the UK, then the blades will probably come direct from the factory to the site, for example, and maybe other components may be marshalled at the blade factory before coming directly to site. But it really does depend on the type of farm that you are building and where you're building it. But either way, a marshalling harbour is ideally close to the construction site and it's basically a big open space with good access to deep water so you can bring heavy stuff in and get heavy stuff out when we're looking at international manufacture the logistical planning starts to become a lot more important now all wind farms have a significant international manufacturing footprint so by far the two most common turbines Siemens and Vestas turbines the majority of the turbine components are assembled in Denmark so that's international straight away when it comes to big foundations you know these things can be made locally but often they're made in the Netherlands or Belgium where they have very large plants to, to facilitate this and they can almost do it on a production line basis South Korea is the main player when it comes to Asia so you know we have to think about how we're going to transport these things around and whether it's cheaper to just put them on a barge and take them directly from the factory to the site or whether we shove them in an intermediate harbour first and generally the latter is what we do this 
is a picture of a heavy lift vessel. This is a very extreme example of a heavy lift vessel. And what it's doing here is it's loading the top side of an offshore substation onto its jacket foundation, which is already there. Now, this top side is probably 3,000 to 4,000 tons in this particular case. Now, typically the heavy lift vessel, which is a vessel with a crane, this one has two cranes, but generally they have one. It's the largest and most expensive vessel in the construction process. And typically they're used right at the beginning of the construction process. They are generally used to conduct piling operations to install the foundations and transition pieces and install the heaviest equipment such as we see here, which is offshore substations. They are generally not used for cable laying operations and wind turbine installations. I will show you that later. So basically when you see a blue water site without much visible on the surface, but you know that it's going to become a wind farm, then typically you're going to see heavy lift vessels approach. I have deliberately shown you an extreme example here. This is the largest, heaviest vessel in the world. It's actually got two 10,000 ton capacity cranes on it. Uh, and the vessel is 200 meters long by 100 meters wide and is based on eight floating pontoons and is self-propelled. That is a very extreme example because a vessel like this is going to cost millions of dollars per day to charter. Having said that, smaller heavy lift vessels are still going to be in the region of $1 million a day to charter. So these are big pieces of equipment. Here is a mono pile foundation. Here is a heavy lift vessel installing a mono pile foundation. And here is a barge beside the heavy lift vessel delivering a mono pile foundation. It's important to understand that the mono pile foundation system consists of two main components. It consists of the pile itself, which is what we see here. And it consists of the transition piece, which is what I will show you on the next slide. When you look at the wind farm, you will never ever see this pile because it's underwater and it is surrounded by the transition piece. One mono pile is needed per wind turbine. And these things are big. They're up to 10 meters in diameter, up to 60 meters long, and they have a diameter to thickness value of around 100 and a mass of up to 2000 tons. That is a very significant piece of metal. What you see here on this picture on the left, if I use my pen, is you see that you've got actually markings on the monopile showing its depth. And this part here at the bottom of the ship is what's called a pile gripper. So what's going to happen is this ship will have maneuvered into position. Now, in this case, I believe it's anchored it may also have dynamic positioning, but here you can see it's anchored with a spread of anchors. And many heavy lift vessels take that approach because the anchors not only hold it in position, but they also add a certain amount of stability to it. What is then going to happen is the crane, the main crane has taken this monopile, in this case, I think it's used a thing called an internal lifting tool from the barge, in the background and it has upended or made vertical the monopile transferred it across the ship and it's lining it up here in the pile gripper the next thing that will happen is the jaws on this pile gripper are going to close and hold that monopile in place the crane can then pick up its hammer which is this part here this long white thing with a red bell on it and we can then start to lower the monopile into the water and hit it with a hammer such that it goes into the ground. Following that, and I'll show you that on the next slide, we'll drop the transition piece on top of the submerged sticking up pile. And the transition piece is of a similar mass or a thousand to 2000 tons, depending on the size. Now, a lot of this pile will be sticking up. In this case, uh, it's probably the part that is painted white. And you'll notice a feature of the pile is that there's a cone on top of it. And that cone is used to help position the transition piece on top of the pile. 
the rest of the pile is going to be buried in the water and hammering this into the ground is a major procedure that causes a lot of noise and kills every marine mammal within about a hundred miles notwithstanding the extensive protection that we put in place in order to join the transition piece to the monopile we grout it now grout is just a certain type of concrete effectively what we do is we pipe the grout into the small gap that exists by design between the monopile and the transition piece and that sets the two in place because banging these things with a hammer is such an extraordinarily noisy procedure a method for reducing the noise is to use a thing called a bubble curtain and the idea is that you pump compressed air into the water in this case from this ship here what it has on it as you can see is multiple containerized compressor units probably driven by diesel and they are many megawatts of capacity and it's pumping compressed air into a perforated pipe that is laid on the seabed in a ring around the work site that compressed air lowers the density of the water because it's mostly air now not water and it in principle limits the noise emanating from the hammering operation now it can be effective but it's still you know a little bit like breaking wind in a tropical storm in terms of what it actually achieves uh, there is another way beyond impact piling called vibration piling um, which is often also used but vibration piling although it makes a lot less noise it sometimes lacks the capacity there's also occasionally a phenomenon called pile refusal or you might hit a boulder and that can result from poor site investigation process and your only option then is to drill or pull the pile out and try again somewhere else so these things do occasionally happen the transition piece as i said goes on top of the pile here we see a similar setup to what we saw before the pile down here is already inserted now this is slightly unusual in that this pile is above the sea usually they slot below the sea and it also has a flange on top which is again a slightly interesting design but either way you can see here that the transition piece is dumped on top of the pile and in the background image you hear other transition pieces already installed ready for the turbine to go on top now as i say traditionally the transition piece has been lowered on top and then grout has been pumped down an internal grout pump in the transition piece in order to join the two together also it's quite common to have internal j tubes so a j tube is where the cables go through the foundation and out through the bottom of the transition piece which is why the bottom of the transition piece is often close to the bottom of the seabed now it may be that this farm is in a particularly shallow area um, and that's why they've done that and you can see here i believe these are the cable outlets but i could be mistaken because i'm not actually familiar with this particular transition piece but somewhere there will be cable outlets in deeper waters so water deeper than about 30 meters monopile foundations cannot currently really be used there's no intrinsic limitation on monopiles other than that the deeper the water the bigger the diameter they need to be and the heavier they get and every so often facilities for bigger monopiles are built and equipment to handle bigger monopiles are built so if you have the choice of using a monopile you will always use a monopile because it will always be significantly cheaper unfortunately there are still instances where we need to use jackets in and those instances are currently water depths more than about 30 to 35 meters one of the reasons it's more expensive is that it's not only much more expensive to make a jacket even if the masses are comparable it's obviously much more expensive because of all the fabrication and welding but you also need three or four piles per jacket now each of these piles for sure it's a little smaller than the single monopile but it's still two to four meters in diameter 50 to 80 meters long and 200 to 400 tons mass and you need three or four of them 
this is an early Taiwanese wind farm with a very, very conservative, heavy four-legged jacket with twin boat landings. Uh, it's a good jacket, but uh, quite, quite conservative, quite expensive design. And what you will do is you will use a thing called a pile insertion frame to install the piles relative to each other. So at the bottom of this jacket, there's a pile at each corner which sticks out of the ground. So those piles need to be located quite accurately in relation to each other so that the jacket can then be dropped on top of the sticking up piles. I'll show you a picture of a pile insertion frame next. The jacket is dropped on top, and as I say, depending on the farm, the jacket is 1,000 to 2,000 tons. The jacket will have large conical openings at the bottom to slide over the pile stick ups, and it may also have hydraulic equipment located underneath it in order to grip the piles whilst the grout is setting, and this allows the jacket to be installed in rougher weather. Here is a pile insertion frame under construction. You can see this one's relatively small. It's maybe 20, 25 meter side length. And these devices here are the holes through which the pile will go. These pads will sit on the seafloor and you can see that it has hydraulic legs on it, which allow the pile insertion frame to be raised and lowered and leveled prior to a pile actually going in it. So what happens is this whole device is lowered onto the sea floor at the desired position. It's then leveled up using hydraulics and then and only then can a pile be dropped through it into the ground and then hammered through the pile insertion frame. So the purpose of this pile insertion frame is to locate the three piles relative to each other. So once all the piles are installed, the frame can be removed. But they're quite big, heavy, expensive pieces of equipment. Again, none of these pieces of equipment are light. This one's probably six, seven hundred tons and has quite a lot of gripping equipment and hydraulics to make it do its job. And don't forget that you don't require this on a monopile installation because you only have one pile. So where it goes is relatively significantly less important. So it's just one of the many reasons why jacketed foundations are much more expensive. A slightly disappointing fact about these pile insertion frames is that they're usually built for a specific jacket on a specific wind farm. So quite often they're not even reused afterwards. Here we have Samcan in South Korea. Um, they're mass producing some jackets for another Taiwanese wind project. And those jackets are being picked up from the construction yard and loaded onto this vessel here for transport either to a marshalling harbour or directly to site. Now you'll notice that they've brought in a special floating heavy crane to do this and that is because these components need to get from the dockside to the ship and as you can see they have these heavy rail cranes but they can't lift it over the dockside and that's why they've used this floating crane to do it. You will also notice that on the transport vessel, there are these very heavy grillages and they are sea fastenings, which are welded to the ship. And then the jackets are either welded, bolted or clamped onto those sea fastenings for transportation. You may also see, depending on where these jackets are going and what the facilities are, where it's going, you may also have the ability to drive these jackets off the ship using SPMTs if it's a roll-on, roll-off vessel, um, rather than using a crane. That hasn't been done here, but that does sometimes happen. You quite often see these jackets being moved around the yards on SPMTs as well. It really depends on what facilities the manufacturer have. I've even seen some manufacturers build the jackets on their side, so build the jackets horizontally and then upend them and load them onto a van. Okay, let's look now at the cable. So up to this point, we've got the foundation installed and that's generally the biggest, heaviest and most expensive part of the project. Typically, we will then install the cables. Often this isn't done in time, but 
in an ideal world, we would do it at this point. In order to do that, we use a cable lay vessel. Now, cable laying vessels are used for all sorts of projects, not just offshore wind. Um, but they are quite specialized pieces of equipment and we use them to install the intra ray and export cables. They often also have equipment for trenching and occasionally dredging. And generally they load the cable at the factory and go directly to the work site for installation. So cable vessels will generally have a drum, which is also known as a carousel. And that whole drum has the capacity to spin like a giant cotton reel. And that can both load the cable from the factory into the drum and it spins when the cable is offloaded and it goes through the cable handling equipment on the vessel and off the back end and into the sea. Depending on the type of vessel, it may also have a trenching tool, which is generally a sort of tracked vehicle with big water jets on it that runs behind the cable and sort of cuts a trench into the seafloor, which the cable then sort of sinks into. And over time, the natural movement of the water on the seafloor fills the trench with sand and mud and covers up the cable. Covering the cable is generally a regulatory requirement, but it also makes solid technical sense because you would be amazed at how many fishermen seem to take delight in fishing cables out of the water fairly obvious reasons, I think we can say. Here we have another picture of another cable laying vessel and it's beside a transition piece on a monopile type foundation. You can see the cable actually at the back of the ship and I suspect that he's just picking that cable up either prior to pulling it into the transition piece or just after pulling it into the transition piece. You can see some of the equipment these big vessels have in terms of a quadrant. They have various cranes which can be used for pulling and manipulating cables into and out of J-tubes and cable protection systems, loading equipment and so on and so forth. Uh, probably remote operated vessel crane here so that they can have a look at what's going on under the water. It's quite a complex procedure but that said once these things get going they can lay one or two kilometers of cable in a 24-hour period so if you have a few hundred kilometers of cables to be laid you can do it in a couple of months it's not the end of the world. Quite impressive technology. Let's look now at the jack up vessel. So the jack up vessel, as we see here, is a vessel that jacks up. It jacks itself up on the seabed to provide a stable lifting platform. So this is in contrast to the very large heavy lift vessels that we saw earlier, which effectively rely on a combination of bulk ballast tanks and anchors in order to provide a stable lifting platform. Jack up vessels, provide a stable lifting platform by resting their feet on the sea floor. They typically have four to six legs and at the bottom of each leg there's a giant shoe called a spud can which spreads the load a little bit over the sea floor. And the reason that we need this very stable lifting platform is because typically they're used for the delicate task of loading the wind turbine components onto the already installed transition piece. So that is something that needs to happen with near millimeter precision because all these components are bolted together. Whereas the foundations, you can have a little bit of slop in there, they're grouted together and they're just dropped on top of a pile and it's a bit dirty and a bit cruddy, but these things have to be accurate. It's also worth noting that in the unlikely event that the foundation is installed out of kilter, you know, a little bit off, we can install, manufacture and install um, little shim flanges in there to ensure that the turbine itself has the required verticality. So they're also, in addition to installing the turbines, and here we see it installing the blades one at a time, um, they are also used for any subsequent heavy maintenance. And before going out to build a farm, these things are fitted with blade racks and nacelle rests and tower holders because they typically leave a marshalling harbour with six to eight to ten complete wind turbines broken down into major components on board. They'll then load the tower on first, then they'll load the nacelle on, then they'll load the blades on individually.
so they take all that stuff on themselves so it's worth noting that jacking up is not simply going to a random pot of the sea and shoving the feet into it it can be an extremely hazardous process you can get punch throughs for example where a foot penetrates a soft part of the seabed and then the whole jack up vessel collapses uh, that does not happen generally in the UK because we have quite strong regulations about proper surveying of the seabed. And it may actually be that before we build this wind farm, we have to go and stabilize the seabed at various positions with rock dumps, for example, in order that the jack up can actually safely jack up on that location. And when you look at the design of a wind farm, you'll always see like a jack up area marked beside a foundation, which is where that jack up can jack up safely without stomping all over the cables that you've put in there or running into a dodgy part of seabed so it's important to understand that this is quite a fine procedure and a jack up process itself takes many many hours because it has to be done very very slowly and very very carefully and in a very controlled fashion the limitations of the jack up vessel in terms of what waves and what sea state it can tolerate once it's jacked up also has to be taken into account because the depth of water that it's jacked up in and the amount of equipment and turbines that it has on board at the time it's jacking up influences its ability to tolerate a rough sea state so it may be that if you're jacking up in the deeper water in the deeper part of the wind farm you cannot take a full load of turbines when you do that because in the event of a significant wave the jack up would not have a good enough safety margin so it's quite a fine science jacking up and i think in part one and part two i mentioned that direct drive wind turbines such as this i a turbine without a gearbox with sufficiently sized direct drive wind turbines or sufficiently sized wind turbines of any kind you need to insert the blades one by one but a slight issue with direct drive systems is you cannot use the gearbox to rotate the unbalanced rotor around to accept the next blade so to do that they have a special hydraulic ram ratcheting a system in here and what you see on top of the turbine in this iso container is the power pack to operate the hydraulics and various tools needed to install that temporary system to allow this blade to be inserted so once that blade's been inserted and bolted on that power pack will be used to rotate the turbine another 120 degrees so that the final blade can be installed and in the background you can see multiple other turbines already completed now this process would have to be recreated in the event that a blade needs to be replaced or another heavy component needs to come off so these blade turning tools do exist and they'll generally be one or two in the country where these turbines are located for use as required the operation and maintenance port is usually developed around about the same time as the wind farm and it may be in the marshalling harbour but often isn't here is Lowestoft in the UK now it could be that as Lowestoft for example multiple operators use Lowestoft as an operation maintenance port and even as a sort of mini marshalling harbour for some parts so uh, Lowestoft which has hitherto been a fairly tragic fishing town is now being transformed into a fairly tra tragic operation and maintenance port for wind farms but it does have a lot more money kicking about it and in fact what was a fish market is now a control room and you can see here you've even got a helicopter base it will have facilities for crew transfer vessels so pontoons uh, trial push on boat landings and such like and it will have briefing rooms workshops stores often a control room the greater gabbard control room from scottish and southern energy is actually in this building and it's actually really good because you can see out of the control room directly into the harbor which sounds like an obvious thing you should be able to do but but is not uh, it may also support larger vessels and equipment including helicopters as we've seen here and this part of the port is being developed to allow larger equipment to go in there and it's worth noting as I sort of somewhat sarcastically said earlier that the reality is that O&M ports contribute the most to local communities 
The staff that maintain and operate wind turbines are typically local people from the local area. The vessels, crew transfer vessels, for example, are often built and maintained locally from little local shipyards that are good with aluminium. And the work that these places do, it goes on for the duration of the wind farm. The construction team might only be around for a couple of years and then they'll clear off. But the O&M people, they'll be around for the whole life of the wind farm, which is at least 20 years and probably 30, 35, depending on how well it's been maintained. So once you get a collection of wind farms in an area, the economic boost that that area gets is significant so another place that's done quite well out of it is Grimsby which again was quite a deprived area uh, more so than Lowestoft even and is starting to find its feet as a result of this kind of business so if somebody says they want to put a wind farm operation and maintenance port in your town I would generally say that's a good thing to have if we look at crew transfer vessels, these are vessels which are used to take people and equipment from the operation and maintenance port to the offshore wind farm for maintenance, servicing and repair. And they come in all shapes and sizes, but they're almost always catamarans, so like twin hull type vessels. They're between 12 and 25, 30 metres long. I've written 20 here because that's the most common size, arguably, at the moment. And they travel between 20 to 30 knots. 20 knots is a more common speed because of the sea state. So for some farms, which are quite a way offshore, it may take maintenance staff two hours to get from the operation and maintenance port to their relevant turbine every morning and two hours every evening when they come home. So it can be quite a trek. But nevertheless, crew transfer vessels are a cheap and relatively useful way of doing it. So depending on what a farm is doing, they'll typically operate between two and 10 crew transfer vessels, depending on the time of year, weather conditions, maintenance regime, and so on. Typically over the summer, they'll boost their maintenance. So during the summer, we will typically do the heaviest maintenance on the turbines for two reasons. One, it's the weather is the best, meaning we can get there most reliably. And two, the winds are at their lowest, meaning we're gonna lose the least amount of money by switching the turbine off for that kind of work. In the winter, we probably only have one or two CTVs on standby. The main disadvantage of the crew transfer vessel is the relatively hazardous process that is required to transfer people and material onto the turbine. And there are quite serious limitations of the conditions in which they can do it. So generally, as you can see at the front of the CTV, they'll have a rubber buffer there and they'll drive straight onto the boat landing and push on, as we call it. So they'll maintain power and forcibly push against the foundation of the wind turbine, which minimizes the displacement between the ship and the boat landing, but it still will rise and fall a little bit, at which point you pretty much have to just jump off and good luck. So. It's not an ideal situation, particularly when the weather's a bit ropey. But that said, they remain by far the most popular maintenance tool. So most wind farms in the world will use a crew transfer vessel as a primary tool for operating and maintaining their wind farm. Because once you actually have a person on the wind turbine, you can actually take quite a lot of gear and have the gear on a platform on front and use the davit crane on the turbine foundation to haul it up. So really the most hazardous part is getting the people off the crew transfer vessel onto the foundation safely. Because of increasing concerns about safety combined with the tendency to build farms further away and bigger, some wind farms are now opting for the SOV or support offshore vessel. The support offshore vessel is literally a floating hotel combined with a minor workshop and a transfer system to allow the wind turbine to be accessed directly from the SOV by a heave compensated gangway of the type that I showed you before. Now, that is obviously very, very much safer However, they are large and expensive. So they're two to 3,000 pound vessels, 80 to 100 meters long. Uh, 
they do remain at sea for very, very extended periods, meaning that the people who operate and maintain the wind farm are going to do a shift of several weeks at sea on an SOV. And every morning they'll wake up, they'll transfer onto a turbine, do their work, transfer off again, go back to their cabin, have a rest, have a meal, have a sleep, get up the next day and do it all over again. So the big advantage really in safety is the stabilized gangway but other advantages are that because of that stabilized gangway it can transfer people typically in rougher weather it operates as i said as a floating hotel and the advantage of that is that it reduces the transit time and extends useful working time on the turbine so instead of having to spend two hours every day getting to the wind farm and two hours every day getting back from the wind farm the transfer time is about 10 minutes because this vessel can be in position at the start of the maintenance team's shift on that particular turbine, transfer them, drive to the next turbine, and you can stagger the shift and so on. So people actually get a useful amount of time on that turbine. Because they're floating hotels, they were also able to some extent to operate through the COVID pandemic because quarantine procedures could be observed However, hopefully that will not be a significant consideration in the future. Don't think any of us want to go that again. They're generally more expensive and they're usually only used on far offshore wind farms where there really isn't any other option. Helicopters have been tried and are used on some farms, but again, helicopters are also very expensive. So SOVs and CTVs are the two main methods of use at the moment. I suspect that because more wind farms are being built further offshore and they're bigger and they require more people and the conditions are worse, etc. I suspect that SOVs will become a more normal way of operating wind farms at the risk of, you could argue, the quality of life of the poor maintenance staff that have to live on them. But at the same time, they typically do half on, half off. So although when they're on one of these things, they don't get to see their family, they don't get to see their friends, they work very long days and they don't have a lot else to do in their social lives. When they're not on these things, they're at home. So six of one, half a dozen of the other. I put this picture up just to show you that repairs of blades can and is done in situ but a lot of rope work is done on these things when they're in service and obviously that requires very good weather in order to avoid this exact situation an increasing number of robotic inspection and even repair tools is being developed and in the next sort of five to ten years we are hoping that a lot of this very, very hazardous rope access work will no longer be necessary because it's not something any of us want to see. You know, the, the hazards are, are real and genuine. Here's a picture of Prince as he was then, now King Charles III uh, on the official opening of the Beatrice control room in Scotland. Now, I show this only to give you an example of a particularly poor control room. And it was something that I had a bugbear about for a long time, that control rooms for wind turbines are messy quite often. They're quite poorly designed. You know, they're thrown together at the best of times. And unfortunately, I have to say the Beatrice one, which I was involved in, is not particularly good and you have mice everywhere keyboards everywhere nothing is sort of linked together nothing is integrated you've got phone here there'll be another phone here microphone doesn't work these spreadsheets indicate to me that the tracking system used to know where maintenance people is has totally failed and is resorting to doing it by hand i'm not saying that's the case but i'm saying i suspect it so control rooms are always in my experience sort of left to a quote unquote consultant to throw together and their consideration of design generally seems to extend to oh we've put a whiteboard in the corner and it's got some magnetic clamps on it and i long rallied against it because there are in the power industry numerous examples of very good control rooms go to a nuclear power station for example and look at one of them and i remember specifically on beatrice writing an extensive report that said all this and then being ignored but i did collect my paycheck at the end of the month so you know all is not lost Here's a slightly better system. This is uh, one that's controlling multiple wind farms at one time. 
Now, the control room for the wind farm does not necessarily need to be the control room for the ONM facility. Typically, the operation and maintenance facility will be controlled from the operation and maintenance port because that is where ships come and go, and their job is typically to track who is where and on which turbine. The wind farm overall control room is generally just concerned with curtailing wind farms and switching off wind farms and handing them to maintenance. So on that basis, most of it is just routine monitoring, and you don't actually need that many people to do it. Let's end it here with a brief set of charts and a summary. So I'm going to go through the main points of the summary, and then I'm going to tell you what these charts mean. So the approval design process, construction and commissioning of an offshore wind farm, it's a complex process. It currently takes around 10 years. This is likely to dramatically shorten as regulatory regimes improve. Governments know that it is important to get this stuff done. They also know that developers are there and they are, if you'll excuse the dual use of the term, developed. They're ready to go and they're able and willing to build these farms quickly and well. So regulatory regimes will improve. Trends are towards larger wind farms with larger turbines further offshore. So. 10 years ago, a 500 megawatt wind farm was a big wind farm. Now I would say it's a small wind farm. Wind farms that constitute as big are over one gigawatt. And the one gigawatt wind farms that are being constructed are often being constructed over phases where the final farm will be two, three, four, five gigawatts or even larger. And they're using larger and larger turbines, which are currently in the 14 megawatt region, but will peak over 20 megawatts very shortly. And they're going further offshore for often no better reason than we've already done a lot of the near shore sites. So we are further offshore is the only place we've got left. Um, the industry is now self-sustaining and it's undergoing unprecedented growth. Now, what I mean by that is that this, this thing's got going. OK, we can do this. We can build these farms. And if I look here at the graph on the bottom, the global total program portfolio by country in megawatts. So what it means is that on the drawing board in the UK, we've got nearly 90 gigawatts of offshore wind. And what we actually have running at the moment, this chart's a little bit old, it's about 11 gigawatts of commissioned offshore wind that we have at the moment, but with a capacity for 86, just from areas that have already been identified. So under construction, under active construction in the UK, one and a half gigawatts. Pre-construction, that effectively means within the next year or two, they'll be building them five gigawatts. Um, support secured for another 30 gigawatts. Um, we've got in development 45 gigawatts in some kind of development. So there is an enormous amount of this still to come, and that's just the UK. And although the UK has, by quite a margin, the most offshore wind in the world, um, other countries are also trying to get in on the game. And Germany, for example, wants 20 gigawatts, um, and that's quite a lot for a country without a lot of sea. But all of this is paling into insignificance compared to the final point that I want to make, which is a recent announcement by the Netherlands that they want 70 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. Now, I've already shown you that the UK has the capacity to develop around 86, 87 gigawatts at the moment with much more potentially future. But we're starting from a point of having about 11 gigawatts already and much more already under construction. The Netherlands currently has 2.5 gigawatts of offshore wind live with about another 1.5 gigawatts under construction. So to go to 70 gigawatts by 2050, it just gives you an idea of the absolutely unprecedented improvements that are happening in this industry. And it is with no small amount of pride, you know, that I can say I've had a very, very small part in that. And um, it makes me happy because this technology does work. You know, it's not perfect. It's not the solution to everything, but it already is generating an awful lot of electricity and it already is resulting in lower prices and it already is resulting in dramatic reductions in emissions and it is going to get better. And doubters and haters 
have already missed the boat. This is happening. Deal with it. On that note, I'd just like to say thank you very much for watching this series. And if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the box below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Take care.